Hello, thank you. Um, Ani, Eli Mitchell, Indigenous Paz, Megize, Indodam, Saginaw, Ojibwe, Indau, Mount Anishinaabe, Zibing, Indonjaba, Awashtanong, Indida. Uh, my name is Ellie Mitchell. I'm Eagle Clan. I'm Anishinaabe and am an enrolled member of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan. I'm originally from our reservation in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and I now live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So this presentation is based on my work as a tribal liaison for two programs at Michigan State University, um, one of which is focused primarily on Anishinaabe language and uh, the others more generalized. In addition to that, I also own and run a bead store called Bead and Powell Supply, which specializes in beads and craft supplies for contemporary indigenous art and powwow regalia. Uh, so I am a member of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe who were signatories to the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw, which ceded the land that MSU was built upon, which is to say that MSU is on my land and my tribe's land. Uh, Michigan Territorial Governor Lewis Cass um, in 1819 brought along over 600 barrels of whiskey to that treaty negotiation. And we know this because my tribe holds the receipt for those 600 barrels of whiskey in our tribal archive. That's not relevant to this presentation. It's just a historical tidbit that's interesting. So this is a quick overview of what I will be discussing today. I'm not going to read all of this. Um, but uh, there are goals in my presentation, and because you know we're on Anishinaabe land, uh, I try to do this in a Anishinaabe way. And so our goals are to provoke thought in the minds of listeners, uh, and for some of the things I say to stay in your minds, to laugh if we have the the chance, and to offer solutions to problems in Indian country. Uh, part of Anishinaabe teachings are that one cannot just point out problems, one has to help solve problems. So we attempt to offer possible solutions as part of my presentation. Uh, some of you may find my talk to be more prescriptive than descriptive, depending on your academic discipline and background. This may be a newer experience to you. And as I said, this is part of a Anishinaabe way of doing and being, and we're virtually gathered on Anishinaabe land, so we're trying, trying to stay true to that. Uh, so just quick overview of who I'm talking about. Um, Anishinaabe people uh, consist of three tribes, the Bodawatomi, Ojibwe, and Odawa. We share cultural practices, history, and linguistic ties, and a political alliance known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Our language is an Algonquin language, and we have ties to other Algonquin-speaking peoples. We commonly refer to the Lenape or Delaware as our parent tribe, and we have an origin story that tells of us migrating west from the Atlantic coast. For the most part, we're now in the Great Lakes area of North America. If you're interested in learning more about Anishinaabe peoples, I recommend visiting the Zeebwing Center in Mount Pleasant. For those of you at Michigan State, that's about an hour north of campus. If you're not able to do that, um, I also highly recommend Michael Witkin's An Infinity of Nations. And I'll have a slide at the end of my presentation with all this info in it, if you're interested. Some helpful vocabulary for this presentation. While I use the term Anishinaabe frequently, it is specific to a certain tribe, and I will sometimes refer to indigenous peoples from other tribal backgrounds, and so we'll use more generalized terms. Uh, Native American and American Indian usually refer to indigenous peoples specifically within the United States, sometimes Canada, and Indian country um, refers to spaces within the United States under the control of Native Americans. So this might be reservations or urban communities, um, casinos, other sorts of places. 
So the need for cultural and language revitalization. And I apologize if the formatting on these slides when I moved it to a Google presentation may have been a little off. Uh, the past several centuries have really decimated American Indian cultures and um, cultural practices and language use are endangered within indigenous communities as a direct result of colonialism. Specifically for American Indians, the boarding school era was particularly effective in disrupting cultural practices and language transmission. This slide shows a photo of the Indian boarding school in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and the building and nearby land are now owned by my tribe. When I say boarding schools, I'm referring to government and or church run schools to which American Indian children were sent, often forcibly over a span of several decades. These schools were run specifically with the intention of stripping away indigenous cultural practices, language, family, and community ties. And if you're interested in learning more about Indian boarding schools, there is a federal report and some good book titles. Um, and again, those will be on a slide at the end of this presentation. Because of that history and the impacts of colonialism, cultural programming is one of the vital services that tribal governments provide. Cultural programming is thought to be so important for Anishinaabek because cultural and community connection is integral to the con conception of well being. So, social and spiritual aspects of a person are as equally as important as mental and physical health. The term cultural programming in Indian country is sort of a catch-all for any sort of event or program that isn't a committee meeting. Uh, so for example, on this slide, on the right side is a flyer for a board game night that's happening on Sundays on my reservation. And this is considered cultural programming. Uh, and our next slide, you can see lots of flyers for cultural events. These are all from my tribe and these were all running within a three week period last month. There is a variety of events here from a traditional winter gathering called a round dance to a luncheon with Anishinaabe language set lessons, a practice session for traditional drumming, storytelling, a youth fashion show, and a Pokemon and Lorcana night in late February. The flyer isn't on this particular side, but last night I was at a youth video game night that my tribe hosted. I brought my Nintendo Switch so the kids could play Mario Kart. And um, by the way, most of the work that these flyers are showing was done by a about a dozen people. This is just one tribe of many. There are 12 federally recognized tribes in Michigan and over 570 federally recognized tribes in the United States. And many, if not most of them, do work similar to this. Within my work as tribal liaison at MSU, I work with tribal programs to offer support. And in 2020, one of my programs was a supportive listening session for people doing cultural outreach. Um, many of them said that they had seen a huge increase in program attendance when they started offering virtual options uh, when they could not have in-person events because of the pandemic. Unfortunately, as we've moved on in our pandemic response, many cultural programs have moved away from offering virtual or hybrid options. So if you read the flyers in this slide, you can see there is no advertised hybrid option on any of these. It's all in-person events. Why is that a problem? Well, all of these programs are happening at tribal buildings on the reservation where only about one in three of our tribal citizens live. That means one half to two thirds of our tribe live outside of the area, which is typical throughout 
tribes within Indian country. So this vital programming is essentially inaccessible on a regular basis to half or two thirds of its intended audience. I know from my work at MSU and also in my shop that there is a want for virtual programming still. Um, we offer drop-in crafting sessions in my shop and we've had very little in-person response. However, many, many people have requested a hybrid option. Uh, unfortunately, we're too overburdened to offer that. And uh, that is also true for many of the tribes I work with. Um, by the way, for those of you who can't see the slide, it's a photo of a half completed beadwork project. And so that is where our possible solutions, which is the point of this presentation, come into play. So, uh, you know, many of us here are coming from an academic background, maybe we do academic research or outreach, and there's a lot of space to be a good collaborator if you want to work with Indigenous communities. And so, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading this. Um, as outside collaborators trying to support these communities, there are several things we can do to like help support that sort of hybrid option, which are to set up and monitor live streams of community events, set up a Teams channel or shared folder to help facilitate easier collaboration with outside co um, collaborators, advocate for offering hybrid options when we're collaborating with tribes and ask if there are community voices that should be included in projects that aren't at the table. Um, the downside of offering hybrid options with American Indian stuff is we end up encountering a lot of white supremacy and racism on the internet, uh, which in my experience uh, uh, can be avoided with a few tips. Um, turning off commenting on social media posts, monitoring or turning off chats, just staying off Twitter. I did enjoy the previous presentation that was analyzing Twitter discourse. Um, that's very brave. <laughs> and uh, making it clear within a virtual space that a space is an indigenous space so that racism and, and white supremacist attitudes won't be tolerated in that space. And for those of you who can see the slide, um, there's a mug that I sell in my shop. And this is one of my techniques for combating that sort of white supremacy is sharing this mug and its related stickers um, that has a very pro-Indigenous um, saying on it, just to make it clear that this is an Indigenous space. So uh, in conclusion, uh, cultural practices are an important part uh, of well-being to Anishinaabek. I'm sorry, I clicked that wrong. <laughs> and recognizing that tribal governments dedicate considerable resources to facilitating that work. However, resources are sparsely distributed and limited. So as outside collaborators, a frequent need that we can help with is facilitating virtual or hybrid options for an expanded reach of these cultural programs. And it's important to do that in a way that in collaboration with indigenous communities as the community will be able to advise and guide the project in a way that is most helpful. These are the additional resources I mentioned. Um, and that is my presentation. Me watch.